Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Reagan Ebler, and I'm one of the co-presidents for the Colorado State University's student chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects. I'm so excited to welcome you all to our fourth day of our 28th annual Landscape Architecture Days lecture series. And before we begin, I'd like to give a sincere thanks to our donors, including AFCSU, the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture, CSU's College of Agricultural Sciences Ag Council, and the Colorado chapter of ASLA. Because of their support, we are able to put this lecture series on for you all. Today, we have the honor of being joined by Andrea Cochran. And at the end of her presentation, we'll be conducting a Q&A with her. So if y'all have any questions during her presentation, please put those in the Q&A section of this meeting. And feel free to use the chat feature to introduce yourselves to one another. And we'd love to know where you're from and where you're joining us from today. So without further ado, I'll pass things to Trent and B to further welcome our speaker, Andrea Cochran. Awesome, uh, thank you, Reagan. So, hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Trenton B and I am the other co-president for Colorado State University's uh, SCASLA chapter. So today, um, our guest is Andrea Cochran, who is the founder and principal of San Francisco-based firm, Andrea Cochran Landscape Architecture. She has been practicing landscape architecture in the Bay Area for over 30 years. In the profession, Andrea is known for uh, seamless interweaving sustainable landscapes, art, and architecture. In her designs, she highlights the experiential qualities of the built environment, and her firm has garnered numerous design awards, most notably the Smithsonian Cooper Hedwitt National, um, National Design Award in Landscape Architecture. In 2014, Andrea was honored with the ASLA Design Medal being the second woman to ever receive this award. A monogram of her firm's work was published in Princeton Architectural Press in 2009. So um, without further ado, I'll let Andrea begin her presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Trenton. Thanks, Reagan. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here virtually. I actually have been at Colorado State um, I forget the last time, I don't know, 2009, I can't remember. Um, but I've been there a couple of times and um, sorry to miss seeing that beautiful city today. Um, but I'm here in sunny California. Um, a little bit about our firm, we're uh, 15 people, it sort of hovers around that, sometimes it's a little bigger. And um, we are, uh, our studio is in San Francisco and we have been, um, and uh, we celebrated our 21st year last year. And um, prior to that, when I moved to California from the East Coast where I was born, raised and educated, I found coming to California a really freeing experience in that um, the landscape here was so different and so open that I found that it really appealed to my aesthetics and I think was instrumental in, in sort of uh, starting the way that the firm, uh, our work uh, looks. Our, our, our work's primarily based in the Bay Area, uh, but also it's, we work all over California um, and we actually have worked all over the country. And so um, the work I'll show today will be from um, actually as far away as uh, Pittsburgh, uh, but mostly in California and, um, and relating to the work I've been looking back and, and, and putting together this, this slide presentation. I've been thinking a lot about the last year and it's been a really tough year for a lot of us. And um, it brought back the memory that um, a little over a year ago, we had our year end reviews and one of the people in the office, one of the associates said, um, you know, I'd like to work from home. I'm, you know, it's a long commute. You know, it's expensive to live in San Francisco and a lot of people commute from the East Bay. And they said, well, maybe I could commute take a day or two and, and work from home. And I said, well, you need, to, in order to do that, let's show me somebody else who's done that besides Facebook and you know, someone in our profession who's done it and done it well. 
And she came up with a couple of examples and they weren't quite frankly that great uh, examples. And now a year later, we're working from home, all of us, we haven't been, it's almost been in three weeks, it'll be a year that we've been working from home. And it's interesting what um, you can do with, um, when you have to, you know? So we've been working independently and, and really trying hard as we've worked from home to kind of build our creative, keep our creative spirit and keep connected to one another. Um, but it has, I sit in my, in my office and I look out at my yard and I have a beautiful redwood tree there. And every day I look at the trunk and watch the light change as I look at the trunk. And sometimes a woodpecker will come and put an acorn in the trunk, uh, in, the, in the bark. And, you know, and I, I've noticed birds that I never noticed before in my yard. And I think that this sort of being at home and being kind of isolated, even though I'm on Zoom calls all day, the idea that, you know, we're all sort of connected to a smaller space and, um, and we're relating to our gardens and our spaces around us in a very different way. And I want to talk about that today because I started thinking about how our other projects over the years, how, you know, how they might be functioning for people during the pandemic and how that might be providing some kind of respite or solace in their lives. Um, and it, it's been a very hard year for, as I said, for a lot of us. And, uh, particularly in California. Um, this uh, photo was taken um, near the Golden Gate Bridge. If you could look out and see through this haze, you'd see the Golden Gate Bridge here. And this is taken at 10 o'clock in the morning on uh, September 9th. And that was the day in, the, in Northern California that the sun never came out. It was apocalyptic and really quite frightening. And that the cause of that was uh, many weeks of fires. Uh, in the past year, 4 million acres of California forest lands and um, urban wildland interface have burned. And um, this is the third year in a row that this has happened. And combined with drought, you know, we, we really are thinking about, you know, and especially now, with the, this weird weather and this polar vortex in the, in the central part of the country, I think there's extreme weather events are happening more and more frequently. And how do we, I think it's a wake up call for many people who really aren't thinking in that way and how important it is to protect our environment and how through our work as landscape architects, we can then uh, connect people, maybe at a deep emotional level. And I think the basis for my work has always been um, that there's an emotional component of what we do. And I think I've been very inspired by artists because I think they delve into that emotional part of our psyche. And I think when you can build strong emotional relationships, people respond more positively and strong, uh, in, you know, in, a, in a powerful way. And hopefully that inspires them to create change. So, so starting, whoops, oh, okay. So starting with uh, a project where um, I was also reminded because again, we've been kind of hunkered down in our homes that in the 1970s, uh, a guy named Jay Appleton uh, theorized that um, we're based, you know, are we, we're going back to our hunter gatherer roots. We're based in the sense of um, what he called uh, prospect and refuge. And this idea that that's underlying any kind of space is like you go to a public space, often you'll see people sitting around the outside or with their back against a wall because they can sit there and kind of survey the whole scene and no one can come up behind them and surprise them. So I think for, for my, um, in thinking about that, in our work, how you create comfort, but also this sort of this idea of this giant, um, kind of um, panoramic view, and then also a place of, of a sanctuary and kind of hunkering down. So in this project in San Francisco, it talks, um, I think, to that, that, that idea of prospect and refuge. So this was a house, um, an existing house that was renovated on top of this cliff. And by doing so, we had uh, lowered the driveway elevation. So we now, instead of going up 20 feet, we're going up 30 feet to the first floor. So creating that uh, an, an exciting and interesting experience for someone walking in 
to, uh, walking up to the house, which the front door is up there. Sorry, I keep thinking I can hit my, okay. So this is the cliff um, and you can see to the top right corner, a car driving up into the driveway, pedestrian gate to the left, people walk up, they reach this flat uh, spot um, and then they're able to uh, walk up the stairs to the front door. So the idea was to really engage the experience of being in a cliff and engage people to their larger landscape views as well. So as you enter the first thing you're, you're it's kind of cantilever out and so you actually can almost touch these these magnificent eucalyptus trees and you can see downtown San Francisco beyond. So this idea again of this kind of visceral connection to the to the plant material walking up against this wall uh, protected from the cars and then reaching this first level and then um, looking down from above, you can see that you can climb up to the first stair. So it breaks this, this kind of uh, daunting stairway up to the front into a series of kind of places where you can take a rest or, you know, and, and so as you walk up, then you stand and then you get the view out. So it's this choreographed movement that actually we deliberately force people to look at the view and connect with their environment as they go up uh, as they go up this walkway, whoops. Then you get to, you know, this, this, this overlook and, you know, this is looking out and then um, walking here on the ground that, you, you know, the first thing you'd see is this as you approach. And then as you come up, it sort of presents itself as a series of planes um, next to you. And you walk up to that first stair, you can't really see the entire way to the top and then, oops, backwards. Um, and then looking out, I'm standing at the edge and there's glass at the edge looking towards the downtown, but these trees in the, in the foreground, which are often filled with escaped parrots that squawk as they, they move around the treetops. And then as you walk closer, you see, you see that, you know, you feels like you can walk right off the edge. And so it's like, you know, the pirates walking off the gangplank, you know, that for me was very interesting that some people refuse to walk out here. They feel too, um, it's too scary for them. Other people just race out there because, you know, they're kind of, they're thrilled by the idea of like looking down the steep cliff and to enhance that experience we actually put grading below so that when you look in, you're looking straight down. So you feel like you could go down endlessly. So again, just sort of tweaking it and making it an even more powerful experience, maybe not a comfortable one in this case, but um, a more powerful experience nonetheless. And then as you come around the side behind the back of the house, because the house is on a cliff, you've got these overlooks looking towards the whole bay. And then in the, um, as you turn, and you're, you're actually cut into the hillside on the other side. So we're going back into that hillside um, with these core 10 steel walls, which you know are kind of of the earth and have that sense of earthiness. And then, uh, and then you're in that, the, you've come up the stairs to the left and you're in the, um, the bottom floor of the house. You look out, you can see these tall walls, which are, are planted very lushly with, um, with the sense of you're know, creating a real sanctuary and a real garden. That's really very much of the sort of yin and yang of this, of this again, prospect, and this is the refuge. And um, a fire feature, you know, again, that's sort of a primal thing, gathering around the fire, um, these stones that you can sit on, these sculpted stones. And then looking back, an even higher uh, property up the hill, it's a giant retaining wall holding that up, which we covered with stucco, and then place this, this piece of corten in front of it, floating almost like a Rothko painting. So it just sits in front and becomes the backdrop for changes in the day and the seasons as the, as the light moves across this face. Um, about half our work is residential work high-end residential work. The other half, as you'll see, is everything from affordable housing to hotels and wineries and um, universities and schools. So it's really, it's the full gamut, but about half the projects are residential work. And I, I think what's really important about that is the projects are smaller and they get built quickly because of that. And so there's a, a really good learning curve for people in the office to kind of try things out, test things, 
and then apply that to the larger projects. So in the larger projects, we learn how to do different kinds of techniques of construction. So working with different kinds of contractors. So they each balance the other and feed the other. And I think creates a rich, richer practice. I think none of us would wanna do exclusively one kind of work or the other. But, and I also say that sometimes it's a little bit like we're Robin Hood because the, the, the uh, the high-end residential projects are, and the other projects are more lucrative. And then when we do these projects, which I, I kind of look at as giving back projects, where we do affordable housing, uh, those projects, we always lose a lot of money. And um, so it just kind of keeps, we feel like it's important part of our work to make uh, equitable spaces, or really beautiful spaces for everyone. So, um, but it, it really does, um, it keeps, I, I think, when you do the affordable housing projects too, you learn how to be efficient and frugal and kind of give the maximum design ideas with the, with the minimum of cost. So both of those things, again, as I said, help. But I think one thing is that we are able to do on the, on the high-end projects is uh, really do uh, planting that maybe would be too much maintenance or too fussy for a, a university or a different kind of more institutional project. This is a small house um, and it's in Palo Alto, which is about um, 45 minutes south of San Francisco. And we were approached by the owner. Um, the street is on the left and you can see it's, you know, the house is here. You know, it kind of fills most of the lot. So it's got two a side yard, one side yard is the driveway. The other side yard is, is very shallow, but the whole house opens out to it in the middle. This is a glass wall and then a very small backyard and a very small interior courtyard and then the sort of front yard. Um, and one of the things that I found is that front yards are it's kind of a, um, a bugaboo of mine that front yards are given up to your neighbors like looking good or, you know, but are they ever used? I mean, I, one of the things I found in the pandemic is that I sit on my, I have a front porch and um, I sit on my front porch and I'm socially distanced. My porch is set back about 15 feet from the street. And as people walk by, we can talk. And I found that that's given a tremendous amount of um, socialization where we would be otherwise um, sequestered. So I think engaging the fronts of where people live and allowing them access to streets and people is a really, really important thing. And I think the pandemic has just shown how important our sort of social glue is. And the more that we can keep people from like being completely in their little refuges in the back and pull them out to the front, I think is something that we need to do as we rethink kind of land use. Um, so in this particular case, um, uh, the, there was a setback from the street where we could put a fence or wall and the client, you know, because they had so little space, wanted some private courtyards. So this wall is, is, is creates a courtyard for the front of the house, which is a, it's a five foot wall, which was the maximum in the setback to the front. This is a low wall, which you'll see, which kind of creates this sort of um, interstitial zone. So it's kind of the public, the semi-private. And then as you move in the very intensely private parts of the, of the property. And then you'll see there's this water feature that runs uh, through the house, part of it metaphorically through here, but if it appears to be one constant thing that, that kind of element that, that ties the entire um, property together. So um, this is looking at the house from the street. And um, one of the things I didn't say is when they took down their old bungalow house to create a house for their retirement, which was mostly on one level, the idea became they had a beautiful, beautiful garden and they decided and they loved their garden and they didn't want that. And, and they really struggled for a long time about whether or not they would, excuse me, redo this, this, this landscape because they had, um, they had so invested in it. But the idea that we could create a really beautiful but different kind of garden for them was, was a really important part of the project. And so as you walk in, um, this is the, we worked, collaborated with the architect on the design of the, the entry, entry uh, sequence. And you can see that low wall that I was talking about. And then this is a, a magnolia, uh, Solangiana here. 
and then uh, the garage opens. And you can see that the driveway is actually, it's, everything is permeable. Uh, we had to, you know, it's a, it's a near a flood zone. So everything had to be permeable. And this is uh, called, you know, gravel pave. And so it's these rings, these plastic rings and the gravel fills them so that you can ride a wheelchair over it, but also it keeps the gravel in place and it allowed us to use a permeable base so that the entire site could be permeable. Um, the front gate is open. You can see your way uh, into the front um, door. And you can see this black Ophiopogon is the ground cover. So it's this kind of bold graphic that comes through. And this is another Magnolia. The other one was in the front yard. What I love about this black Ophiopogon with this, um, with the Magnolia is, you know, when the beautiful uh, pink deep magenta blossoms fall, on this, it's just spectacular. So again, these moments in nature that you remember all year where you know, the, the trees in bloom and then the, what it looked like when the leaves fell on this, on this black ground cover. We used um, bamboo uh, to screen this courtyard. And, and then, oops. And then looking sideways, you can see, so we have the low wall at the front, the magnolias and then the bamboo, and then you walk through, and then if you are in the backyard, you can circulate around there. And then what was interesting was um, because the site was so small, and, I, and she's an incredibly good cook and eating and cooking fresh things is important to them. So actually this area became a cutting garden and a, um, a vegetable garden. So the idea that the front yard actually is a functioning um, garden, um, it was something that was important to us. So, you know, this low wall keeps dogs out, kind of says, you know, this keep out, but it, it gives back to the community. So as people are walking along with, you know, taking their evening walk, they look and they can see the tomatoes growing on these, on these armatures and they can see the, the flowers growing. And then behind that is a, is a, a hedge of, uh, of, uh, of uh, ramness, uh, a laternus hedge that is behind that, you know, sheared that, you know, so the five foot walls here, but this is giving privacy to 10 feet. And then looking back, you can see from the house, when you look out on the driveway, you're actually looking out, even though it's very narrow, you're looking out at a, at a garden. So every view from the house is looking out at a garden, even on this very tiny lot. Um, so the front garden, you can see the wall that, that surround, separates it from the street and then the hedge that I just showed, and then the water feature, which this is a kind of source of the water feature running through. And then um, we actually relocated some of the Japanese maples from the previous um, house to this project. Um, and, you know, just these uh, um, bowls of, of uh, with scloranthus and just this very kind of quiet meditative space and keeping the plantings to the outside. So the seasonal changes of the leaves and the flowers happen on the outside, but the core is very quiet and very meditative and calm. And I think this is the kind of space that speaks to us today where we can really be in our gardens. And then looking from the living room, when you, when you, uh, this is the water feature that runs all the way through. And we actually, um, boxed up all this giant timber bamboo prior to the construction and grew it while the, the house was being built and then brought it back. So when you walk in to the, from the front doors on the right, you walk into the living room, boom, you hit this with this like 20 foot ceiling looking out at this. Again, we, we planted a hedge and then the bamboo in front. So you have the dark color of the bamboo and the light color of the columns and the sort of soaring height, these things will get 40 feet tall. And this idea of just, again, inside outside connection and bringing life to the interior spaces. And, you know, pots with a, a Henry Lauder's walking stick um, outside, again, a lot of seasonal interest. And then in the backyard, again, uh, places to sit, looking out, this Japanese maple and the other end of the water feature that runs through the project. So as I said, um, you know, we also work in um, on affordable housing projects. This project was built, um, I, I would guess maybe 15 years ago. It's an older project. Um, this is it, um, this pit from this pink and gray over to the green. It's in the middle of a neighborhood called the Tenderloin in San Francisco, very tough neighborhood. A lot of drug deals going on on the street. 
a lot of crazy people walking around. It's a very tough area. And this is a housing for um, subsidized housing for families. They apply um, and it's a lottery system to get in. Um, and so you can see the, the, the building is in the center here, little tiny entry courtyard. And then this is the main outdoor space. And then there's a roof garden, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. Very tight budget, very um, uh, low maintenance budget. Um, and when you're inside, there's this garage door that opens up and they can have events that go inside to outside. But when you walk into the front um, gate, the front entry, you're actually looking out at, right at the garden. The whole, the whole apartment complex um, uh, opens up onto this space. So originally we asked them what they wanted to do. Did they want children's play area? Because it's mostly families in this, in this apartment building. And they said, no, there's a playground a couple blocks away. What we need is a quiet place so that people can open their windows and not and feel uh, calm. And that's, I mean, I think that's what happens here. We, we built this water feature. It's only got a quarter inch of water. So, you know, the kids can play on it, but they're not um, going to drown, you know, so it's a very, um, and there's three jets, which you'll see. And the idea is it just creates a lot of volume because the whole area is about eight feet long. The water is running over the edge, creates a lot of volume of, of, of sound. And then again, using the bamboo and tree ferns, you, you can see how we've kind of layered out to create as the maximum of green and the smallest amount of space. The seating's made of wood, reclaimed wood um, from blown down uh, Monterey cypress trees, which is pretty rot resistant. And again, it's a warm and comfortable material to sit on. So you're out there, you can be comfortable and you can remain here for a while. Um, the water also reflects the, the sky and the, and the light in this kind of very deep cavernous space. So again, thinking about all of that is really important to make, I think, a, a, a very um, powerful and, and quiet sanctuary. And then this is looking from above, um, just a little design thing. These are uh, uh, light wells that go into a basement office for the nonprofit that runs this project. And then you can see we've kind of um, striped the, uh, the paving to go out where it becomes dark, lighter as it goes out and kind of draws your eye out um, you know, towards the, the green. And on the roof, um, they, they, they had no money to take care of the roof. And actually partway through the project, they thought of um, uh, eliminating this from the budget. But um, we, um, in this corner over here is a, uh, is a laundry room. So people can be out here and they can kind of keep an eye on like what's going on out there. Teenagers were um, kind of hanging out down there and um, they, uh, uh, you know, it, it becomes a community space. And so what we did was we designed these, you know, old horse troughs and then just had a, um, a host bib next to each one and each person's responsible for taking care of their own. And it became so popular that they had to actually do a lottery to see, and it changed every year about who got one of these, um, these horse troughs. When we were there the, taking photos this day, um, this man came out, he was doing laundry and his, his uh, he works in the evenings and his wife and kids were uh, at work and at school. So, and he, he said, you know, when I come here and I work on this, this was a broccoli. He said, it just makes me feel like I'm at home. And like just having this little bit of dirt on the roof gave him tremendous kind of solace and, and, and just brought him back to his roots and made him feel a lot more comfortable. And again, in this uh, very, very um, predatory environment. Um, creating um, a space, everybody needs a space. And so now and this is a, a kind of a, an elite space, but this is a project we did at Stanford University for, um, uh, it was a combination, it was a, a competition to do a, a combination gallery and, um, uh, uh, art gallery and um, meditation center for students at Stanford. And it was um, a gallery for uh, the work of Nathan Oliveira. And he was an artist and teacher at Stanford for a number of years. And uh, donors had been trying to build a kind of a, a gallery of his work uh, for years on campus for 20 years and it couldn't happen. And so what happened was Nathan was uh, asked to uh, uh, 
he finally passed away and this project happened after. But the reason it happened was because it was a collaboration between the Dean of Religious Life. And it turned out that on this campus, they had no place for Stanford, you know, as expensive that is and as elite as it is, they had no place for students to go and chill out. And so they decided to combine these two uh, functions into this gallery. So we worked with the architects, Aidlin Darling. And uh, I mean, I think what it shows is again, this idea of like a focused meditation and this ability to connect with nature and how powerful that is. When you arrive, there's a, a wall here and you'll see this in the slides, you can, or you can arrive by bike, uh, you can ride, there's a bike path here. You can walk up, you meander through this ginkgo grove here, you go to the front door and then you can go into the, into the gallery or you can continue on to the dormitory back here. So when we came to the site, we were standing like right here, it's a parking lot had been on the site. It was adjacent to this oak woodland that runs through campus. And when we were standing there, I was sitting there with uh, the architect and he had spent a lot of time on site, practically slept there. And he said, um, I said, well, what are you gonna do about the grade change? He said, what grade change? And when you're standing here, you're about four feet higher than here because it's a very gentle slope. It, and architects don't really think about things like that. It was maybe a 3% slope, but because it was so long and narrow, you didn't really perceive that you were actually standing higher. And I said, well, yeah, look, we're about four feet higher than there. And he said, oh my God, I'd never noticed that. And so what happened was because he brought us in so early, we we're able to actually inform the design of the building. And a building I think sits really beautifully on the site based on their response to those early conversations. So when you come in here at the entrance, you're at grade, but at the front of the building, you're hovering at about 30 inches above grade. And when you get to the back, the, where the reflecting pool is, you're, you're cut into grade about 18 inches. And that allowed us to create a, a court, an elevated court or a sunken courtyard that um, is in the center that almost re reminds me of uh, something you'd see at Roanji or in Kyoto, one of those gar Japanese gardens. And then, so it has a, a whole series of different kinds of feelings. So I'm gonna walk you through it right now. So this is looking from the Oak Grove back at the building. And, in the, and you can see how open the building is to the landscape beyond. And it's designed so that you can come here at any time of the day or night and you don't actually have to enter. You can stand outside and see these beautiful paintings. They're uh, of kestrels in flight. These paintings are, this one I think maybe 25 feet long. And they're really quite spectacular in scale. So, um, and these louvers kind of on the building kind of frame your view so that you have a sense of, of scrim and privacy. So looking out, uh, someone can be sitting here and be feeling as if they are in that oak grove or they can be facing the paintings for meditation. So this, this diagram shows the kind of the walking through and you know, we think about how you move through a site very often in our work, I think, uh, landscape, unlike architecture, you often experience by walking through it and how it feels like underfoot creates a kind of total body experience that really heightens your sense of sort of this kinesiology of the, the, the feeling of walking and moving and feeling your feet on the earth in, enhances that sense of, of connection to nature, I think, as you move through the space. So we have that, we have a meditative walk here, which I'll show, and then sort of how these, these spaces integrate um, with, with the natural surroundings. So when you, when you come to the site, when you arrive, you're, you're at the street and you can see, you want people to feel safe. So these, these gaps allow you to see if you were walking back to the front door, you could see if someone was walking behind here and you would see their, their movement. And again, you wanna create a sense of safety and not create places that are too private where someone could feel like you could be uh, watched. Um, and then you can see here how the, the building is, is elevated um, about 30 inches um, where I'm standing up from the ground and then meandering through this ginkgo walkway um, through this decomposed granite and then to some stepping stones to the front door. Um, you're sort of pressed at one point up against this rammed earth all, wall and the texture of the rammed earth, you feel like you could touch it. 
and the sense of really tactile of qualities of it and the kind of earthiness of it. Again, I think as you're moving, you're shedding as you're walking along and, and this experience of becoming closer and closer to the front door where you can really separate yourself from the cares of your worries of the, the real world. And then you can choose, as I said before, to go walk way to the dormitories and take a shortcut through here, or you can walk in and see, um, and walk into to see the first painting. And then looking back at the entry, entry um, the bench at the entry, the front entry. And then turning from that painting out, you see this reflecting pool. And again, this repeated idea of this, these, these fences where you can see if someone would be standing behind there. So again, you, feel, you know what's happening around you. There's only four inches deep for ADA so that we didn't have to put a, an edge here. So um, it, was very, it was a very tricky thing. We did this all in one pour because we did not have a huge budget. Um, uh, for this project. But this allowed us to create, um, that we have the building as one wall, the um, place to sit here, and then another place to sit across the water. So different people can be experiences at the same time. And then a focus of meditation, we went to their um, boneyard on the campus and we picked these uh, stones, which actually turned out later just synchronistically, it looked like uh, an earlier painting of uh, Nathan's. But um, these became kind of an inexpensive way for us to have sculpture um, by use it, reusing these old pieces uh, from leftover from other projects. Um, the rain garden, water coming off the roof into this uh, uh, sedge filled bed. And then you'll see that it's not a complete box. You know, I like to open things up so that, you know, you kind of get light, real light coming through. And you, again, feel like it suggests an enclosure, but it's not a complete and um, uh, overwhelming enclosure. You can see the movement of the trees. I mean, for me, the shadows moving across the wall mark time. And you can see that, you know, again, um, that's also, I think, mark that passage of time with nature and that kind of enhancement of nature creates a stronger, more powerful experience, I think, to the people who experience the space. And then continuing to walk um, around and then looking back to the front. And we even use these stones instead of benches, again, to create a more uh, organic kind of feeling to the, to the um, space, like a Japanese garden. Um, and then walking around the building through the oak woodland, you can see the center area is where we have the um, the, uh, the the guard the uh, raised garden that kind of jab, that references uh, Kyoto. And so again, someone could come here at night. Um, they can sit on this edge or around this edge and experience this meditation. And we even built the building around this pepper tree, so that you can, uh, it actually goes through the roof and we work with the arborist on campus to make that happen. So you can see that here. And then this is right when it was first planted, a Japanese maple and another um, from the boneyard, we found this cube of granite when we drilled a hole in it and made a water feature. So again, there's that white noise that again allows for one to meditate and kind of again, creates a, a separation from the real world. And then, um, uh, as I said, you can see how it's rising out of the ground. So people can sit here and look out at the oak woodland and again, be there at any time of the day or night. Looking back. And then the students actually have kind of adopted this water feature. And every time I come out there, I find these pebbles kind of um, moved in different places, which I think is great that they've kind of made their own little sculpture. And then again, this the sound of water, so important. And then, um, then we, we also um, copied the um, uh, Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, had a meditative walk that was uh, a copy, oops, of the one from uh, Chartres in France, um, built in, the, I think, the 1200s. So uh, this idea of um, this, that you can walk and meditate and kind of have this walking meditation, again, is something that I think 
is formalized here, but I think as you walk in nature and you are close to nature, this idea of this kind of uh, walking meditation, I think is something that is pretty powerful. And that brings me to art. Um, and this is the spiral jetty, uh, Robert Smithson's piece in the great, from also from the 1970s um, in the great Salt Lake. And um, one thing, uh, when, I, when I first saw this, I always thought of it like this, to the left. Um, and what Richard Serra said about this is, you know, our perception of this piece is a very graphical one where we see this, but we don't really realize that it's meant to be walked. And he understood, Smithson understood the power of walking in a place, walking, walking, walking. You could see little tiny people there walking to the center. So the idea again of walking in nature and being part of that is something that I think a lot about. And I think even now, you know, with, with the pandemic, when we are outside and walking, I think, yeah, it's the one place we can be where we don't have to worry quite so much. Um, this is um, another art piece, also a walking piece. Um, this is by Bruce Nauman, and it's at a, a place called Oliver Ranch in uh, uh, about, uh, in Sonoma County, about an hour and a half north of San Francisco. Bruce Nauman's work is a lot about passage. I mean, you may have seen his videos, um, not videos, um, the neon pieces, um, where um, they're kind of blinking and saying words and phrases. So I was very surprised when I found out that he had done this piece. It's a, a quarter of a mile long, and the, the tread width is the same on each step, but the riser height varies. So you, as you're walking it, you need to be very careful or you would fall. Clearly, you can't do this on a project it's not legal, but that's why it's art. So um, so here you can see my office there, it's a number of years ago, walking along, it actually at, down at the bottom goes across a road. So this idea of at this at Oliver Ranch where he has pieces by Richard Serra, Martin Purrier, other famous artists, the idea of making site specific pieces was really important and, and so, um, sometime later, we were asked, this, this is a couple of years ago, we were asked by um, an artist to collaborate with him on a site specific piece for the ranch. So um, this is the plan and it's, it's set in this oak woodland with these beautiful boulders that were kind of with the trees growing through them here. And um, the artist's name is Doug Hall and he was um, um, inspired by the work of uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who's a, um, a philosopher um, working in the kind of mid part of the last century. Um, uh, and he, he did a whole tractus, which is it's a little above my level of understanding, but basically his, his point of view is that there are certain thoughts or concepts you can only have with language. You can't, if you can't articulate it, you can't think about it except things like love and hate and these very strong emotions, those are things that we don't need language for. Um, and so he kind of went back and forth on this in his in this tractus. But anyway, um, so Doug's idea was to create a kind of a walking meditation with that, where he worked with the, the San Francisco Girls Choir to uh, sing the, the words of, of uh, Wittgenstein's um, tractus. And, and so as you start to walk, you're walking um, up this path um, to view, you know, all the different artworks that are on this 300 acre ranch. And when you get here, uh, the owner, Steve Oliver, turns a, a switch. And as you start walking, uh, there are, I, I don't know, something like 15 different um, stations with uh, speakers. And as you walk through, you start to hear this, these sounds of like, like one girl speaking here, another girl speaking here, and suddenly they're all around you. It's a very, very powerful experience and I'll try and recreate it here. Um, so this was the site um, before, and this is where you put a stake in the ground and we're trying to mark out with some flags and the stake, how you approach this flat spot. And then there will be, which you'll see in some of the photos, uh, the speakers, and I'm just going to play um, starting at this, um, you'll, oh, so, so what I did was um, it, the, I, I, I set these steps into here, um, into the, cut them into the hillside, and then I pulled these, 
you can see back here, there were very few boulders on the right. So I actually pulled them through so they almost look like a natural, um, like as if a volcano had to spit them out and kind of gone across and cut the, 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 uh, the steps through the center. So as you go, you'll see that, um, and I went back to photograph and unfortunately the grasses had grown in so much you couldn't see it. So I had to go back later. So now you'll see it and, and has people experience it and this sort of magical sense of like, you know, like this new space kind of carved into nature, but still having a sort of um, um, really primitive response. And these are the rocks as they change throughout the year. Um, it's just so beautiful. So um, this project is actually on the cover of Landscape Architecture um, this month or last month. This month, uh, as far as I've seen, I, I get them a little late now. Um, and this is an affordable housing project. And it was based on, um, there's an area of San Francisco. And it's a very interesting article, if you can read it, because it's not just about our work. But there was an um, initiative, excuse me, taking place in San Francisco. It's called San Francisco Hope. And it was a $2 billion initiative to replace some of the uh, housing, um, the uh, 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 Section 8 housing that had been in San Francisco and were really in deplorable conditions. A lot of people were living in former army barracks. Crime was rampant. Um, and so these areas were bulldozed and all the residents were given right of first uh, entrance back in to be part of this new, new, newly designed community, which will be a little bit denser, but also be mixed use. So it won't be so ghettoized so that you'll get people of different income groups, but also enough people of um, more than enough of the people who were initially there will be um, replaced in a, this supportive housing. So um, this was a really interesting project and um, it, it combines community center, daycare, and just uh, giving um, wonderful places to live um, for people who have really had very little. So this is the entrance, the, the road is to the left. It just dropped off, you're right at the top of the hill. It actually has incredible views. We designed these benches, this idea of this kind of, um, this, uh, what do you call it? Uh, this kind of guitar shape of uh, the guitar pick shape was something that repeated itself as a, a kind of a soft form, but kind of um, a little bit forgiving. And then this sort of working with the architects, we created this bench, which at the entry. And so the idea repeats itself through the, the entire project. So there's the bench. It's made out of reclaimed wood. We um, really, this one is, uh, oh, I forget. Um, I'll think of it in a second. Um, this was reclaimed wood that we had used um, there, vines growing up the, the wall, um, kind of a grapevine growing up to cover this entire wall. And then you can see how high up we are in this view. And so this is um, one of many uh, new projects in this development. And uh, Gary Strang did the master plan for the whole, the whole, um, uh, pro uh, the whole um, kind of revitalization of this area. Um, there was a, a, a middle school behind us, much higher up. So this project is sort of cut in. You can see this, the, front, the front is here, that entry courtyard was there. And you can see this um, over podium, um, a, a garden space here with all the units looking down on it. Um, the outside space is another, another um, wing and then daycare and then the central community, the community space. 
So looking down again, as I said, this is the front. You can see we use that guitar pick shape and then repeated this in the childcare area and just kind of making really fun kind of shapes for the kids. Um, these are, this is the area that's over, um, this is all um, a podium. And so the planting here had to be in planters. And um, uh, this hillside behind is very interesting, was dug out, there's a, a soil type in, um, uh, occurs in some places of the world, not that many, called serpentine and actually make asbestos from it. But it's um, highly toxic to certain plants, most plants. So finding plants that would do well on this rock escarpment was something that became a kind of a, a technical challenge. But also we wanted to create something that looked overgrown and like nature, a sort of an idealized nature in any case, and then create something that was colorful and low maintenance, mostly low maintenance that would be kind of virtually indestructible were for them to take care of over the years in this in this community that doesn't have huge budgets for maintenance. And then allowing, we worked with the architects to create this, um, this oculus that brings light down into these lower floor offices. They have a wellness center here and supportive services. So you can see here we have succulents here. These are people's apartments, these windows. So we wanted to keep space. So give the people in there something nice to look at, something that really fed their soul, but also would be again, a deterrent to having someone just kind of come right up to them. Um, and then picking that up and then using these uh, reclaimed street curbs. Again, I wanted materials that felt kind of like they had more organic quality to it, not something that was, uh, you know, uh, so finished and perfect as if like we had poured concrete. We wanted it to feel a little bit wild and natural. And so here's the supportive services, the wellness center, um, a community meeting room. And then you can see we work with the architects to originally it was just going to be a square, you know, or a rectangular um, oculus, but we decided, or, you know, a light well. And we said, well, let's pick up on some of the landscape features and do that. And the architects worked with us. And it beautifully, I think it works well because it also bounces light down into the space in a really beautiful way. And so you can see how this kind of wild garden, we didn't want the kids running around everywhere in here, but we wanted them to get into it at least at some point so that um, they, they felt like they could experience nature. Um, and so we have the Flomis and the um, Mifofia and um, uh, a lot of these other, uh, the Echium that grows wild everywhere. They're plants that are just kind of almost like weeds that can just kind of grow on their own. And then when we were out there to take a picture, these kids were happened to be there and they were just hamming it up and uh, uh, they were having a great time. And it made us feel really good to see them really enjoying the space the way we imagined it would be used. And then looking back towards the, the windows of the units and then um, uh, just looking at the, um, the different plant combinations. And the water also drains here instead of a drain, just having this little pebble, you know, everything is draining off there. And also then the corten doesn't bleed and stain the, the, the concrete. Um, and olive trees in the center, everything super drought tolerant and low water use. Um, moving through space also is something I think we thought about for this university project. And, and that did make, that made me think a lot since we've been shut down and people have been working and like how new public spaces will work in the future. And the idea here was to bring to places of collaboration as people walked in and these, you know, between this uh, cancer research center and this cardiovascular research center. So the scientists would meet each other but also I found that the opposite is actually kind of important in that, um, that we would create places for people to be by themselves separate from others in a, in a larger space, which is kind of with the pandemic, how we're thinking of things as well now. So it works, I think having flexibility as we design, because who knows what will be the next big thing, um, you know, I think offers us a lot, offers a, a lot of opportunity for change as our needs change over time. So um, the design was inspired by what, this was all on um, fill land in San Francisco. And so this would have been a salt marsh at some point. So we decided to kind of create that, that feeling in the, in the plant selection. 
And also the, the design was based on the um, uh, echocardiogram and also a seismograph, given that we are in a seismically active zone. So the idea of the paving kind of moving in and out and the planting kind of layered over that to create these spaces. So again, socially distanced spaces, people can see over, so there's a sense of safety. The movement of the grasses, I think, is always moving with the wind. And so again, it's a lively space. It's not a static space, but a space that if you were sitting here, you could feel like you were, you had your back protected, but, and you'd also have your own little space, but you're separated enough from other people if you want to be. Um, and communal tables for, um, for um, meetings or people, a place for people to uh, congregate. Um, and then also sort of native grasses to, instead of lawn to form places where you could lie down and take a nap. Um, in the fall, the sort of layering, the grasses are designed in um, there's like penicetums and uh, uh, they're, they're all lined in, um, in, 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 uh, uh, in, in rows kind of, so that they kind of layer up against one another. And again, there's a kind of a, a pattern to it that is expressed throughout. Um, and just champsia and juncus and um, I can't remember all of them. And then bamboos at the front that are kind of creating, again, making this space off the main space be kind of its own space. But again, it's permeable to the street, so it's safe. And so this kind of layering shows up here with the calamagrostis and um, I think that, that's uh, this champsy behind. And then again, as you can see, there's plenty of places for people to be separate, which I think is important now. And then at night, the lighting. Um, and then um, this is the last project I'm going to show. We, we won a competition um, a while back to do um, a, a park in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And this is the first Carnegie Library is back in the left corner. Um, and this whole area was, uh, uh, was um, there was uh, urban renewal in the 1960s done very badly where they just bulldozed an entire neighborhood broke up the whole social fabric of that neighborhood and then put in these uh, mid-rise uh, uh, apartment buildings and uh, an office building to the right. So this, this um, park, um, this is after, um, was looked like this when we started. So when we started the competition, it was sunken 14 feet at the bottom from the surrounding grade. I mean, it's everything they tell you not to do. William White talks about social spaces. Um, homeless people were sleeping under these canopies. Um, it, all the, 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 there had been a fountain here. This actually won a competition when it was first built. Um, and Hideo Sasaki said it was the only thing. It was part beautiful. Well, you know, times change and um, it, it wasn't holding up and the city couldn't maintain it. And so you can see that the first thing, and then it was also, um, this building is on the north. Uh, this is on the north of the building. So what happened was in the summer, it was blazing hot, no shade. And in the winter, it was cold and the you know, in shadow all the time and windswept. It was just horrible. So, um, and this is it from, so the Children's Museum is in this building here with these two um, uh, uh, cupolas um, and then apartment buildings left and right and then the office building below. So um, after going round and round and I can do a whole talk on just the design process for this, many community meetings and church basements and we won the competition and I, I don't really do many competitions because it's very hard for me to work without knowing the client and what they want. And just to make up an idea out of my head is not how I work. So the idea here became, um, we won the competition with this crazy idea and then uh, everyone loved it. And then we would show it to community and they said, we hate it. And so we had to completely redesign it. And basically it came to the point where this had been a, um, a very important civic space since the Revolutionary War when this area was subdivided and, and, and given to uh, 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 veterans of the war 
uh, to um, thank them for their service. So th from the very beginning, this was like the common green where the cows could, could um, you know, pasture, and then it became the merchant hall here, and it was a very important community space. And so um, originally in, the, in the, one of the later iterations, there was an X with one of those fountains, those Victorian kind of designs where, you know, the fountain in the middle, two Xs, and a lot of people in the community would have been very happy if we had brought back that Victorian design. So we were influenced to build something that worked for today, which was to create enough paved space to have an art fair or a, um, you know, a farmer's market, enough green space so that it was soaking up the water and not running all the water off and that kids coming to the museum could run and play. And then taking up this elevation change, filling it in so you could actually see across and be safe and then planting it entirely with plants that were native to the uh, Allegheny River Basin. And then this uh, was a rain garden here uh, by retention that um, was all planted with natives. And so, and, and the reason we, we, we did this competition is because we love the work of this artist, Ned Kahn, and Ned Kahn had a long relationship with the museum. And we knew when we won the competition, we would be collaborating with Ned um, on an art piece for the, the project. So um, uh, a site-specific art piece. So here, here is how it uh, came out, um, this, this grid of poles, which he called Cloud Arbor. And um, uh, what I loved about it is that it was completely permeable and part. It wasn't a piece just appended onto or plopped down onto the plaza, but it was thoughtfully considered in its placement and its use. Uh, from, from the very beginning, and it was an incredible collaboration. And so we started with that. And, and Ned's work, if you haven't seen it, Ned's a, based in California, um, Northern California, so I'd known Ned before, is based on making the kind of the, the aspects of nature, making the invisible visible, like wind, fog, um, uh, all of those things that uh, the forces of nature um, to make um, a, like it's swirling in a for um, in the museum. So all of these things became really important um, for us as, as we thought about, let's just like really heightening people's sense of their environment. So looking for through, you can see that this cloud arbor is starting to uh, create this, this ball, which was kind of Ned's concept. And then you can see what happened was interesting to me is these people around it really have taken ownership and they leave these chairs and tables out all the time. And I think they've had one chair stolen because everyone is watching, talk about eyes on the street because they love this park so much and it's so well used, they really keep an eye on things. And the, and the museum um, also programs uses for it. It's the guy walking through. We actually planted clover for the lawn so it fed itself. Um, which was, I think, interesting. And then to the right is the, is the rain garden. And then the stone is all the stone of the native Pennsylvania bluestone that um, uh, was used. And you can see here on a warm day, the kids just go crazy. Um, and this, the museum's having one of their events here um, at the park. And then you can see these women sitting here and this is the rain garden. And what's so interesting to me was when Ned's piece, um, when the cloud ball starts to fall to the ground, you actually get the whole park covered with this haze and, or the fog. And what happens is you could be anywhere, you're transformed, you could be in the middle of the country. And I think it kind of like, again, like the meditation, like the meditation walk, I think this integration of art with landscape creates a, a sense of, of, of calm and peace and a sense of leaving your everyday world. Um, and here it is with the Joe Pye weed um, and some of the panicum. And, and then I'm just gonna play this uh, video of that Ned has um, that whoop, thought I was playing it. There it goes. What I love is when it partly dissipates and it creates this 
you know, blows across the park. Kids really love this because they get lost for a minute and they're hidden and they, there's a sense of terror and then they scream. And then there's like this giggles that happen afterwards, which I just, I love. And um, so I, I, I just, I think in closing, I, I hope I've um, inspired you to think about the emotional aspects of how we relate to environment and how we can enhance those connections with people to their place and to the other place and the places that they visit. Because I think that through our work as landscape architects, we can really create powerful connections to the land. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so the time now is 6.06, .06, which means we have approximately 25 minutes or so to ask Andrea the questions you've all been posting in the Q&A section. So uh, please feel free to continue to ask the questions and we'll do our best to get through as many of them as we can. Um, Reagan and I will be alternating with asking the questions the audience has been asking. So um, let's begin. Uh, Reagan, you can ask the first question. Well, the first question we have is, you mentioned your insight into front yards as a result of COVID. What were some other insights you gained on landscape architecture and design due to COVID? Well, I think the idea of, um, you know, which I, I mentioned in the, uh, one of the later projects is designing spaces that are flexible, that in the future, we just don't know how people will live. And, you know, having spaces where um, it's not so prescribed so that a small group, like someone could be alone or someone could be in a larger group. Um, I think that um, really making the spaces that people visit, like that are not visit, but see and experience regularly, really special, the places right around where places people live, either what they see outside their window, providing something that changes over time, that's not static. So I know for myself, if I'm looking out and I, I see um, uh, a, a magnolia and I see it bursting and then I see the pink flowers and then I see the leaves and I see the leaves fall. I think there's a progression of nature and create providing places where you can watch the movement of nature, like the leaves on a, a shadow on a, a, on, a, on, a, on a side of a building or a wall. So all those things that you can amplify nature. And, um, and so I think in the case of like with working with the artist, I think that, that they amplify nature in their ways, but I think we can do it with our ways with the passage of time. And I think also thinking about how people move through space and how we can use that as a way for people to connect with their environment. Cool, thank you for the response. Um, I have a second question. Uh, it asks, uh, what characteristics or skills are essential for success in landscape architecture? Um, I think, uh, just a natural curiosity and always wanting to learn. I feel like um, 
I'm learning all the time and I've been doing this for more than 40 years. So um, I feel like every project I learn something new and hopefully I'll continue to. And so I think that natural curiosity, always wanting to know more, you know, I, I'm always learning new plant materials. I'm learning more about, you know, we've learned so much over the years about soils and, um, uh, pro, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, um, the microorganisms that live in the soils and how we can make things grow better with um, different techniques that we're learning about. Um, how, um, uh, how people re relate to space and how we learn from that as we watch them use the space and try effectively to make better spaces every time we do a new, a new garden or a new landscape. Um, for me, um, I think it's that curiosity and just wanting to learn and see new things and just kind of fill our, um, our minds with all the, all the you know, the possibilities that are out there. So through art, through uh, anthropology, through psychology, everything we can learn makes us better at what we do. I think as landscape architects, we are such generalists, but I think that's our strength because we pull together from so many different disciplines and we can use that in our work. Thank you. Our next question is, do you have a set of foundational goals that you want to achieve when designing any site? Or is there not specific goals and it's site specific? Well, um, I think <laughs> there's several criteria we, we think about when we take a project. Um, um, and I, so I think one of them is, can we do a really great design? Will the client allow us to do something unusual or different or push the envelope in some way? Um, will, we, um, will we be learning something when we do this project? Is this a new area for us? And this provides an opportunity for us to learn something. Um, will we make money? That's, you know, we do run a business. So, you know, occasionally we have to make money. We can't, it doesn't always happen. I would say that every award we've won, is, is directly proportional to the amount of money we lost on that project. So um, I think that, so, you know, will we make money? Um, and, um, you know, will other people see it? Will we, you know, will we be able to enrich other people's lives with it? So um, those are kind of the criteria. And I think that basically, I, I think that probably makes sense as to what, you know, um, why we take a project and what I what I get out of it, but I, I don't go with any specific goal that it should be this or that because you really want to listen to the client about what they want. And as I said before, we don't do competitions because I feel like competitions is are about the designer making up how people want to use the space, and um, I really prefer to have strong client or community that informs me as to how they want their space to work, so we can create something that's for them, you know, it's not for us. I'm not, I'm not gonna live there or I'm not gonna, you know, use it. Awesome, thank you. Um, so our next question, uh, how do you use art to influence your projects? I think, God, art is so important. Um, I think it just enriches it in so many ways. I, well, first of all, I feel like I learned from artists. I've been so inspired by Robert Irwin and his um, his use of scrim and layering and kind of uh, framing. Um, those are things that um, I've learned. And, um, and I think that other artists I've learned about materiality, you know, Richard Serra, people like that. Um, and then um, that there's a sense of, of artists have the freedom to tap into our deep emotions and uh, cause us to create, um, uh, I don't know, I mean, there, there's an emotional component to art that's really powerful, at least to me. I don't really relate to art on an intellectual level. I, if it hits me in the gut, then I know that it's been a good, powerful experience. And you know, one of the most powerful experiences I had in art and in nature was going to lightning fields in, uh, in New Mexico. 
and um, going out and watching the sunrise and hitting those those poles out in the in the high desert, I felt like I was just I couldn't believe it. It was just like electric shock. So I think that that in that experience, art made that it gave scale to that vast landscape and made me appreciate nature more because of juxtaposition of art with this, the scale. Cause I could sort of measure myself against these 20 foot poles, 23 feet pole, foot poles, but in that vast landscape without that kind of human scale of something to measure yourself against, there's no sense of the, the how big it is. It just, it's, it's featureless. So again, this sort of juxtaposition I think is interesting. Thank you. Our next question is, what is your favorite type of project to design? <laughs> um, I, was, I was, we were talking about this the other day um, when we were trying. I, I really like wineries and I like, I, I like wineries because, and I wish I had done more of them, but um, I think as a project type, it's really interesting. It's, um, it's agriculture, it's, uh, it's got an industrial component, it's, got a, it's a working farm. Um, it's got a hospitality component, so you have to make something beautiful and compelling for people to come and visit. And, um, and they tend to be in beautiful places. So um, they're, you know, that, that's kind of a fun project type, you know, you get to, I mean, my favorite landscapes in California are, um, you know, the orchards that you see in the Central Valley, you know, with rows and rows and rows of trees. I, I find that very calming. I'm actually, um, wild nature kind of scares me. And um, a sort of man adapted, like agricultural landscapes to me are really beautiful and really calming. And um, so I guess there's something in that too. Thank you. Um, next question, what inspired you to join the landscape architecture field? <laughs> you know, landscape architecture, a lot of people come to landscape architecture through accidents, you know, um, it's not like your guidance counselor told you, hey, you should become a landscape architect. I don't know anybody who ever had that experience. And most people I know, a lot of people I know didn't find it till they were much older. So I was lucky. So um, I actually wanted to go to art school. My parents, um, uh, told me that I could not go to art school because I needed to be able to support myself when I got out of college and that art was not going to do that. So I needed to select a field of, if they were going to pay for my college, it didn't pick something that was actually going to make money. So I, I, my second, I always liked natural sciences. I loved nature and I loved, um, you know, biology and all the natural sciences. So I said, um, okay, I, and I think it was sort of like, you know, I was 18, I loved animals. So I thought I'll become a veterinarian because that, you know, I, I can use that. So I think it was kind of a romantic idea. And then I got into, um, so I didn't, I, I think I'm a little ADD. I didn't really read the, the instructions from college where they mailed to me and said to register for the classes. And I thought you were supposed to, bring it with you and register when you got there, but you had to register ahead of time. So when I got to school, I had, um, I went to Rutgers for my undergrad. And so it was the ag school. And so when I got there, there was all the classes were closed. And so the only one, and so I, I was able to find a lot of classes and then, but the one class that didn't fit my schedule was the animal science class. So I'm in tears, I'm 18, I'm in the Dean's office, you know, and with my parents, I can't believe that they did that. But anyway, we're, my parents are with me in the Dean's office and the Dean is saying, he's trying to get me to stop crying. And he says, well, here's a class, it fits in your schedule, take this, it's called environmental issues. A one credit class, a good survey class for freshmen. So I said, okay, so I took the class and every week they had someone kind of talk, come to talk about a different aspect of the environment. Someone came from public interest research group. Somebody came who was a, a botanist, talked about botany. And then the, uh, one day the head of the landscape architecture department came and a very charismatic guy. And he started talking about landscape architecture. And I went, huh, art, science, huh? And like the bell went off and then um, I changed my major. I never took animal science class. So 
um, I was very lucky and um, yeah, and then second semester I took my first landscape architecture class. So um, it was destiny, I guess, I don't know. Thank you. Our next question is, what areas or organizations do you suggest to get involved with to pursue work in community outreach and affordable housing? Um, you know, I've thought about this a lot. We talk a lot about, we've talked a lot about this in our, um, uh, our, our studio this year, um, um, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement and um, the idea of cre creating uh, more diversity and, and equality in the profession. We've talked a lot about that. And one of the things I've thought about was as an individual, um, we've actually um, had, um, we're gonna, we're, we're supporting a, a couple different programs in community, one with uh, kids who are in middle school to get them interested in the arts or to underserved community. And so to get them interested in the arts. So there's uh, volunteer positions and, and um, uh, groups like that. And then also um, we have one coming into our office as an intern. So I think there are community groups and, and, and the, we have the intern coming through um, uh, Architectural Foundation of San Francisco has a, um, uh, a mentorship program for high school kids. So we have a high school kid coming into the office um, um, for a few hours a week to kind of tag along and follow us. I think bringing more people into the profession needs to start at a really early age. And we should all be thinking about how we can um, get into the schools and, and even, even like middle school or, or in late elementary school to teach kids about our environment and how um, how they can be uh, forces for change and not just um, that this is actually a career that you can do. I don't think people, kids really are aware of that. So where this sort of landscape architecture is something that people don't really think about as a career, I think we need to start early to give people the, um, let them know what we do, you know? And so, um, and I think, you know, in, you know, for an office, you know, we're, um, we contact, you know, all the, um, the um, nonprofit groups that we work with for uh, the housing. Um, and that, that would be a good way to, to, to work with those communities, the people, the nonprofits that actually um, uh, fund and build these, uh, these, these projects. Thank you. Um, next question here. Uh, who are the landscape architects that influence and shape your design approach? Well, it's funny. Um, when I was in college, I didn't really know what good design was. I didn't really think I had gotten it. And then, um, and then uh, when I was in graduate school, I, uh, I saw Dan Kiley's work and I, I didn't really like it. I thought it was too simple. I thought, well, anybody could do that, you know? And then, you know, as, as time went on, I, I really realized that, you know, there, the, what Dan Kiley did was take the kind of tradition of the, those, those gardens, those beautiful gardens that you have in um, France, you know, those like, you know, Vaux le Vicomte and, you know, the, you know, those kinds of gardens where there's subtle changes and manipulation and grade to create a suggestion of an outdoor room or, you know, a cover that creates a canopy and the sort of layering. So I think Dan, and but put, doing it in a uniquely American way, like putting an orchard instead of like, you know, plane trees or, you know, a way of making it, um, harken back to our history as, you know, an agricultural nation. So I think that to me was really interesting. And then uh, another person, um, uh, I think that was influenced by, um, by Garrett Epo, not the work he did at EDAW, but his early work that was done in the 1930s during the depression uh, for the Farm Services uh, Board. And um, the idea, like he drew things with like hedges and, and you know, how you, how you define space through plants and through elevation changes was very, very um, inspirational to me. And that's when I really, I think it kind of clicked then when I, when I saw that work. Thank you. 
Our next question is, what role do you see landscape architects playing in the growing environmentalist movement and combating climate change? Well, I think we're, as landscape architects, we're uniquely um, positioned to run complex projects that uh, address climate change. I mean, we know a little bit about so many things. We know a little bit about civil engineering. We know a little bit about soils. We know a little bit about, um, you know, plant plants, you know, uh, uh, remediation, all of these things. And so we're able to really lead complex teams, which, you know, these problems are not simple problems. I mean, I think what we can do is bring awareness and we can all do our, um, our projects with, you know, um, where we're thinking about, bringing plants back into the environment, using rain gardens, you know, all the things that, you know, clean and, and keep water from um, becoming polluted. But I think bigger than that is this idea that we are, um, we really are the, the, one of the few professions that is, 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 is able to understand and, and sort of be the liaison between all these different scientists and, and community groups and, and so I think that we are well positioned moving forward to really make huge, huge changes. Awesome. Um, so next question we have here is, uh, <clears throat> what is your best advice for students in landscape architecture who are applying for a job? Um, wow, it's such a hard time right now. Um, I think it's really hard. Um, I think fortunately, uh, people who are going to be graduating in the in the in the summer, you know, we're probably in a re much better position than people who graduated a year ago. Um, we talked in our firm. Uh, we hired someone who'd been our intern, um, and one of the reasons we hired her because she was familiar. She had come into our office as an intern and was familiar with the firm, our culture, and I think um, working um, from home. Uh, how do you bring a culture together where people can, you know, like join your culture if you've never met them, you know? And so that's something we've struggled with, but I, I think this year, I think um, things are gonna be starting to open up in the summer and um, into the fall. And I think that people graduating are in a, a, a pretty good position because I think that um, firms will probably, some firms will have delayed hiring for the reason I, I stated. And I think we'll be looking for people. And, um, but I think the best way is um, always, if you know somebody in a firm, it's always the best to go through that way of, of approaching them. Um, uh, you know, resumes can help when people are looking. Uh, we do, we, we don't look all the time, but when we are looking for someone, we go back to see, who sent us a resume and we go through it. And it might be months later, but we do do that. Um, I think, uh, you know, through the school, uh, the schools sometimes have great uh, outreach programs through uh, alumni. Um, alumni, finding alumni in your area or in other areas that you might want to relocate to is a, a wonderful way because people always want to help alumni from their school. And, um, and I know Colorado State has a great reputation with a lot of firms. Um, so I think you guys are in a great position. The, those of you who are at Colorado State, this is an excellent reputation as, and I think a lot of people want to hire people from uh, your university. So I think you're, you're in a good position. And I know there's other people here from other areas um, uh, watching this, but um, I do think that alumni is a, is a great way to um, create connections. Thank you. I'm noticing it's 628. So I think we have time for one more question. So our last question is, what do you think is the most important part about your job? Hmm. Um, um, well, uh, I think that right now is making sure we have work. <laughs> um, that's on, a, you know, when you run a business, you want to make sure everybody has good work as, and um, is working to their potential. So I think um, that's probably the most important thing. Um, and then I think just, uh, um, I think providing leadership to people and setting a direction and the kind of um, the culture for the office. Um, 
I think is another important part about what I do so that we're kind of all rowing in the same boat, the same direction, and that we feel like we're, we have common goals. So I think setting the office culture is the other part. Um, and uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I have to think about that a little more. There's so much about what I do that I love. So, you know, um, I mean, I, the, the great thing about being a landscape architect is, you know, 40 years later, I still love what I do. So I think very few people spend their life doing something and feel at the end, you know, um, that, you know, time well spent, not like, boy, I wish I could retire tomorrow, you know? Um, so I think that um, I feel very fortunate to have found something that gives me such pleasure and it's a way for me to help other people too, so. Thank you all for- That's awesome. All right, so we're at 6.30 now. So that's all the time we have for questions. I wanna say thank you again, Andrea, for joining us today. We're so excited to have you. Um, we're, we have another speaker coming on March 3rd. I hope y'all can join us. So thank you again, Andrea, and thank you to all you participants. I think we had about 150 today. So that's super exciting. Um, yeah, hope to see you all again March 3rd. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Andrea. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.